right, here we go on with paradigm theory. Again, I start in the same way. I give you the first, the basic idea of paradigm theory. And, and in, in, in this, um, in the next 10 minutes, I can only give you a very basic idea, namely a sort of a starting point of paradigm theory. And now I'm going to uh, use what I introduced earlier, namely this terminology of normative positions versus uh, descriptive, uh, versus um, um, uh, normative versus descriptive positions. Remember I said, um, when I had presented inductivism, I told you that this is a normative philosophy of science in the sense that I introduced this position by showing you that it, it sounded very plausible and reasonable to fulfill the postulates of inductive generalization because you think about them and think, yes, these are good rules, good rules in the sense that there are rules that lead to good scientific knowledge, reliable scientific knowledge. So the argument I presented for the position was an argument how, that, that supported how science should proceed, right? therefore a normative position. The contrast would have been that we all together make a tour here through the labs and look what the scientists are doing, the scientists are doing, then we write it up and describe what the scientists are doing, and then we say, okay, according to what we saw here, science consists in the following, then we simply describe it. And that's a different procedure, completely different procedure, because theoretically speaking, all the scientists here could do bad science, right? Unfortunately, Hannover is, uh, could be, it is not, believe me. No, but it could be, theoretically, the city where the worst science in the world is being done. So when you run around and describe what they are doing, you describe just bad science and you don't know it because you have no, no quality measure. So the normative procedure avoids that completely. That says, look, we know what we want. We want to have reliable knowledge. So we think up the methods that should be followed such that the result of these methods will be reliable knowledge. And that's a normative procedure. We're thinking up the rules, right? We're not describing what people are doing, but we're thinking them up. And if you recount what I did in deductivism, I did exactly the same thing. Again, we didn't walk through the labs and talk to the scientists, but derived from the problems that inductivism posed, I proposed in presenting deductivism how these problems can be avoided or be, be solved and then said, look, the different way is this. We accept theoretical elements everywhere, but then we have the hypotheses and what should we do in order to avoid the bad ones, the false ones? Well, we test them and that eliminates the false ones. Wonderful, okay? And you followed that and said, yes, that's, that's a rational procedure, right? That's reasonable to do it. So this was, again, a normative procedure, right? Now, the point is, of course, that produced problems we couldn't solve. So, but here comes, comes a turn that is away from these normative procedures. Paradigm theory says, well, these normative procedures, good and fine, but we start differently, right? They run into trouble, and what we do now, we compare the normative positions with the history of science, right? We look whether science really proceeded according to the rules that deductivism and inductivism describe. Right? So paradigm theory says, all right, let's look at uh, deductivism. Deductivism scientist, uh, says that scientists should always test their hypotheses. Right? And then we can say, OK, let's look at the history of science, whether that's true, whether scientists did indeed or do indeed always test their hypotheses. And then you can say, okay, let's see what happens then. Now, it's not that easy because um, if there is a discrepancy, which happens indeed in the science, that's not immediately a clear result. It says, okay, the norms are, say one thing, say the norms of deductivism, say one thing, and the reality is different. Okay? But that has, there are two different possibilities if scientists do not behave in the way the normative positions posit. That is the case, and uh, I'll come to examples. We have, we have a discrepancy between norms, how science should be done, and facts, how science is actually done. Okay? So, but the question is, if that is a discrepancy, that means they cannot stay together. But the question is, which one is false? And that's an open question. Because there are two possibilities. One possibility is, say, 
that these norms that inductivism and deductivism posit that these norms are for some reason false. For instance, unrealistic or idiotic or whatever. Right? That may be a, that's a possibility. We don't know. We thought they were reasonable, but we may be wrong. Right? They may be unreasonable, and therefore we should give them up. That's one possibility. But there is another possibility. It could be that the norms are okay. And the science that has been done in the history of science has been extremely sloppy and bad science because it didn't follow these norms. That could also be the case. Right? Who knows? Well, you don't know in advance. I'll give you a different example. If you look here at Herrenhäuser Straße, I think here in opposite, it's Herrenhäuser Straße, right? And there are the cars, okay? There's a norm how fast they should go. It's 50 kilometers an hour. Many of these cars don't follow that rule. They go 55 and they get fined, okay? Now you say, okay, that's, that's not a problem. They should be fined because it's 50, okay? Now imagine we get a new mayor in Hanover and the mayor says the maximum speed in Hanover is five kilometers per hour for cars. All right? And then, of course, if you look at Herrenhäuser Straße, I guess not all of the drivers would obey this law because they think that's idiotic. I mean, it doesn't make sense to drive only five kilometers per hour. So you have also a discrepancy then. Most of them would perhaps do 10 or 15, I don't know, 100 or whatever. They wouldn't obey the law, right? Then you have, again, a discrepancy between the facts, namely how fast they drive, and the norm. And the norm saying, in that uh, hypothetical case, do only five kilometers per hour as a maximum. And of course, here it is quite clear that we would criticize the norm. We would say, it doesn't make damn sense to drive five kilometers per hour in a city, right? I may be willing to discuss 40 instead of 50, or perhaps even 30 instead of 50, which is a discussion going on today, by the way. But certainly not five, or if five is still to one kilometer per hour, right? That every pedestrian is much faster than every car, all right? That doesn't make sense, right? So what I'm going, to, what I'm meaning with this example is this: if we have a discrepancy between certain norms and certain facts, namely that the norms say something else, what should be done, what should happen, what should be the case, from what is actually the case, it's not clear where the fault is. It could be that the norms are idiotic for some reason or other, or it could be that the facts are just very bad facts. As, for instance, if someone does 100 kilometers in Hanover in front of a school, right? That's very bad behavior because it's really extremely dangerous for the kids, and nobody should do that. That is very clear. This fact is really a sign of a very bad thing, okay? So the facts can be bad, or the norms can be bad. But it's not clear a priori what is bad, right? So we have here a situation that's very interesting when we have to deal with, namely the paradigm theory. First of all says, look, you normative positions, I'm not saying you are false, but I want to bring to your attention that we have a discrepancy of what you're describing, how scientists should behave, and what we can observe in real science, how they do behave. Right? There is a discrepancy. I will give you uh, specific examples for that. You may have already seen examples if you compare one of some of these positions with the work of your supervisors or so, or what you read in the literature or so. The point is simply we, we start to have a new sort of problem, namely the problem of a discrepancy between norms and facts. And that is where, where paradigm theory starts, and that is becoming then interesting what paradigm theory has to say about discrepancy, where that leads to for the development of another position in the philosophy of science, hopefully one that will avoid or solve the problems that deductivism and inductivism has. There are two main possibilities to explain the discrepancy between the normative philosophies of science and what can be described as real science in the history of science. Either the norms are wrong, for instance, they are unrealistic, and there must be something of that sort going on that we saw already in the problems of deductivism, because these norms cannot be fulfilled without self-destroying the whole enterprise, so there must be something wrong, but possibly that's not the full story. The other possibility is that the actual practice of science is bad. For instance, that the actual scientific practice, of course you are not, you're certainly convinced that can't be the case, but look, who knows? Who, a critical view, perhaps, discovers that much of scientific practice isn't as good as it should be because it's dogmatic. It's just sticking to a certain point of view 
where deductivism would say, hey, wait a minute, you should criticize your point of view. It could be wrong, right? And you shouldn't just stick to it. That could also be the case. It could be the case that much scientific practice is dogmatic and therefore it should be criticized. That's also a possibility. We can't judge that a priori. So we must find somehow a viewpoint from which we can then judge what, what to do with this discrepancy between the normative philosophies of science and the actual history of science. And paradigm theory will help us in doing that. It will assess somehow these practices. And we'll find out that uh, after the develop or during the development of paradigm theory. That's what I said from the discrepancy alone. One cannot judge whether the norms should be given up or the practice, if the, uh, or if the practice of science should be changed. This is just the open question. And remember, this is in general the case. You, when, whenever, wherever that is, where you have certain norms and you have a certain practice or a certain reality, and the norms and the reality do not fit, it's always open what's wrong, right? You may have a revolutionary theory of society, for instance, that tells you society, that gives you norms for society that are not fulfilled in society, for instance, norms about justice, and then you look at real society and you find, well, these norms of justice are not fulfilled. There are always two possibilities. It may be that your norms are bad, you may be convinced of them, but they may still be bad, right? They're just completely unrealistic, that's one possibility. And of course, the other possibility is your norms are OK, and society is just bad by being unjust. Right? That's a possibility. Or it may be a mixture of two. Right? It may be that your norms you're developing, say, in a radical form of whatever, communism or socialism, whatever it is, or anarchy, or whatever it is, you develop certain norms, and then your norms may be just you know, overstated and unrealistic. And society is unjust, and it's also bad. Right? So the discrepancy alone, that is a very general point of view one should be aware of, because usually people just make a decision, say, oh, my norms are wonderful, I'm an anarchist, and anarchy is really the best in human life, so society is so bad because there's so much um, uh, orders and constraints, so uh, we think we should um, uh, criticize society. Well, perhaps you are right, but perhaps you are wrong. Perhaps your norms are just unrealistic. This is always an open question. Mostly people make a very quick decision in that respect. They either adhere to their norms or they adhere to their defend them. For instance, society think that's all OK. Um, but it's, it's just from the discrepancy, nothing follows. It just follows something is wrong, but you don't know what is wrong. And that's the same in science. One should be aware of that. And here, I think, a, a, um, a certain amount of criticism is very useful to be to be uh, aware of the fact that from the discrepancy alone, nothing follows with regard to one or the other party involved here. Okay. Now, before deciding this question, that's what I'm proposing here and how I'm developing the position, before deciding the question what is going on here, whether the norms are wrong or whether the practice of science is wrong or whether both of them have deficiencies, um, paradigm theory aims at, at a description of general characteristics of science, and especially, uh, over, uh, especially a description of the development of science over time. Right? So what we get from, from paradigm theory seems to be first, at, at first sight at least, a little remote from what we did so far. Because paradigm theory as a descriptive philosophy of science now aims at a general description how science develops. And you will not be able to make immediate contact from this, this general description, how the sciences develop, to the normative philosophies of science. So you have to be a little patient. That will come later. But it's interesting in itself, what paradigm theory tells us about the development of science. But we'll have to, you have to wait a little until we can make contact to the earlier philosophies of science, inductivism and deductivism. So be a little patient and just listen to what paradigm theory has to tell us about the development of the sciences. OK, that's the framework. And what paradigm theory gives us, proposes to us, is a developmental model of science. And I'm going to tell you more precisely what that means, a developmental of science. Now, paradigm theory describes the general characteristics of the development of the basic disciplines of the natural sciences. Now, that's quite a little bit. 
So the general characteristics, and which general characteristics this will be, I'll show you in a second. The general characteristics of the development of the basic disciplines of the natural sciences. If you look at the natural sciences, there are basic disciplines and there are more applied disciplines. You are involved in the applied disciplines mainly. Basic disciplines are basic physics, basic chemistry, basic biology, basic geology. There are basic disciplines in the sciences and what you do is uh, more in the applied domain speed, in the stronger uh, engineering domains where you apply certain results from the sciences and you have your own developments of course in engineering science or people in the in horticulture science in various branches of uh, biology, uh, botany, um, also engineering, design of greenhouses and also uh, for economy you are more in the applied domains of sciences. Now what paradigm theory aims at is a description now of the development of the basic disciplines and you will see that an understanding of the development of the basic disciplines of natural science is also very useful for an understanding of the applied disciplines where you are in, right? So that's not just useless because I'm talking about something that doesn't concern you. Of course, you did have your classes in your bachelor degrees, for your bachelor degrees in the basic sciences. Of course, you learned some biology, some chemistry, some physics, and so on and so forth. Okay. So, that's the basic disciplines of the natural sciences as opposed to the applied ones. It's important to know that um, paradigm theory mainly speaks about natural sciences and much less about the social sciences. Now, social sciences have different developmental patterns often from the natural sciences for various reasons to which I come. And now, this, these correct, general characteristics of the development of the basic sciences are described by a phase model or a developmental model that is a model that tells you how the sciences develop. Okay? If you can't imagine anything, what that may be, be patient, in a second you'll see what I mean. It's a developmental model or a phase model that tells you that sciences, the sciences typically develop in certain phases. So there will be a phase one and then a phase two and a phase three. I'll give you the details in a second, just that you know the general picture. It says it's not a completely continuous development such there is nothing you can distinguish in that development, but a phase model says yes you can distinguish certain phases. You have a phase one and then there's a transition and then there's a different phase and that phase two is somehow different from phase one. It's not an absolutely continuous development where you have no differences happening in between, uh, but there will be differences that lead to these phases. Okay, that's abstract, but you'll see it um, in a second. Well, that's what I just said. In such a model, different phases of a science's development are distinguished, and, it, and that temporal order is described. So we have phases in a certain order, and a phase model just describes you uh, the, the succession of these different phases, describes you the phases themselves and their succession, meaning the transition. And you have to, of course, understand why there are the phases and why there are transitions, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. So that's the general way that um, the paradigm theory gives you such a phase model, and the phase model is supposed to describe the development as it happened in history the development of the basic disciplines of the natural sciences. That's the idea. And what we learn from them regarding the normative philosophies of science and also the um, uh, mechanisms um, uh, and the working, the inner working, so to speak, of the applied sciences we'll see later. I must, you must be patient and first understand this one and then you'll get the point of view to uh, approach the other problems. Okay? In each of these phases, this is now a characteristic of these phases, the practice of science is very specific. So the difference between these phases will be that the practice of science, the way science is done, is different in the different phases. Right? You may ask the question, oh, that's very strange. Science have different phases. What's their difference? Well, the difference concerns the practice of science. And you'll see immediately then, in the next, uh, from the next slide on, what these differences between practices consist in. Okay? That's the abstract picture. If you don't really know what's going on, don't worry. It'll become concrete when? Now. Okay. 
Now, first, well, first one more abstract sentence. The face model, I'm sorry for this one, but that, that will become some sense. We'll get some sense, but uh, I didn't get the temporal order on the, uh, on the transparency right. OK. The face model is a cyclical model, or more precisely, a spiral model, forget about that in, at the moment, of scientific development. And its structure is as follows. And here comes the structure, if my slides do what I want. Yes, it does. Oh, I bring that all together. What is the matter here? Okay, here we are. So here is the phase model. It's this one here. We have a phase P that leads to a phase N. Phase N leads to a phase R. And then phase R leads back to N, not really to the same N, but to a different N. I'll show you at the next slide. Okay. So we have three different phases. It's a cyclical model. Well, it's a spiral model in the sense when I go from N to R, and when I come back to N, I don't come back to the same N. I come back to a different N, right? A new N. So in a sense, we have a spiral moving, well, upwards, for instance, okay? And here you see, I tell you why I have the letter P here. P stands for pre-normal science. I know that you don't know what that is, but I have to introduce that term once, and I introduce it here. P stands for pre-normal science, N stands for normal science, and R stands for revolutionary science. And I'm going to explain, of course, what pre-normal science, normal science, and revolutionary science is, okay? So that is the basic model. So paradigm theory tells us, look, if you look at the development of a basic discipline in science, say physics, a certain part of physics, say electrostatics, right? then you find the following development. You start from something which is called pre-normal science in electrostatics. You don't know what that is, but that's called pre-normal science. Then we'll have a certain transition to a phase that is called normal science. We get a phase of normal science in electrostatics. And for a while, we have this sort of normal science in electrostatics. And then there are certain events, which I'm going to describe, that lead us from this phase of normal science to something else, namely a sort of revolutionary science. And then we'll have a phase of revolutionary science for some time. And after a while, we get another transition, namely to a phase of normal science, not back to the old normal science, but to a new phase of normal science. Okay? That's the mechanism. You don't understand what the phases mean. I'm going to explain them to you. So you see the structure here. This is apparently or obviously a phase model. We have different phases in the development of science, many phases of pre-normal science, normal science, and revolutionary science. And we have a cyclical or more precisely a spiral model, you know, moving upwards from P to N to R and then uh, to another um, N. And uh, to show you that a little more closely, well, that, that is what I told you more or less. The errors in the model should be understood as follows. From P, a first phase of normal science, N1, is reached. Then N1 reaches to a first phase of revolutionary science, R1. And from R1, a new phase of normal science, N2, is reached, which in turn leads to a new phase, R2, and so on and so forth. Okay? So it's not really something which is completely cyclical, Cyclical, where you come back to the old stuff and then you go somewhere else and then you come back to the old stuff. No, no, no. You come to something new, but it's again a phase of the same sort of character. The N2, the normal science N2, has the same sort of character as N1. It's all normal science and that means there is a specific practice of science, which I'm going to describe in detail, of course, what the practice of normal science is. That's the general idea of this phase model that we have something like, and that is, of course, sounds interesting here, phases of revolutionary science, where something revolutionary somehow is going on. And of course, I'll have to explain exactly what that means. Okay? Is that a clear picture in principle? You don't understand the details, but you should see the structure first. You have the whole picture now, and we fill in now details. The details I have to fill in is, of course, what is pre-normal science, what is normal science, what is revolutionary science? And then, of course, 
Why do we have a transition from pre-normal science to normal science? Why do we have a transition from normal science to revolutionary science? Why do we have a revolutionary science to normal science transition? And what's the difference between the N1 and the N2? Right? The difference between these phases of normal science, because they are not identical, they are different. So what's the difference? Okay? And once you have understood all that, which takes us another three hours or so, then you'll have understood uh, this phase model. And then, once we've understood this one, we can go back then to our original question and ask ourselves, what can we learn from this descriptive account of uh, the development of the basic sciences? What can we learn from that with respect to the normative philosophies of science, which brought us into problems? All right? So that's more or less the program for what is to come.